I'm sure it is with joy that the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Welcome to the Hope Today video series entitled Discovering Jesus. If you're a regular visitor, you know that you can download a study guide from our website, lightandlife.ca. That is the word light, the letter N, the word life.ca, lightandlife.ca. And you can also listen to our radio program. This sermon partners with our program titled Hope Today 077. You can find that also on YouTube under that same title. While we've been on a great journey these last number of weeks, as we've been focusing on the person of Jesus Christ and discovering more about him, deepening our understanding of who he is and what he came to do, with the goal that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, have life in his name. Our text today is John chapter 9, starting to read at verse 1. John chapter 9 at verse 1 to the end of 12, and then jumping down to verse 35 to the end of verse 41. If you have your Bible with you, open it up and let's read God's Word together. Hear God's Word. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus put some mud, uh, made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I, I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. And then skipping down to verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, that is the man born blind. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is God's word to us today, and we give thanks to him for it. Let's pray together. Oh God, we pray that you would open our eyes to your truth today. Take away the darkness that often clouds our days. For the darkness of doubt, we pray, O oh God, shine the light of truth. For the darkness of despair, give us the light of hope. And for the darkness of loneliness, the brightness of your presence. Father, come shine your light upon us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you read through the Gospel of John, you discover that Jesus uses a number of images to refer to himself. In fact, um, throughout John's Gospel, he makes seven I am statements. I am the bread of life, he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine, and so on. And in our text this morning, he makes one of these statements. He says, I 
am the light of the world. He's already stated this more fully in chapter 8, verse 12, where he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I talked about this on our radio program this past uh, in, this week, and, and he says it again here in our text, chapter 9, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. What do you think that means? Well, in our text, Jesus makes this statement, and then he follows up that statement with a demonstration of what it means. He follows it up with a miracle of making the blind man see. And I have three truths that I'd like us to focus on this morning. Jesus is the light of the world who shines a light of hope on suffering. Jesus is the light of the world who shines a light on the purpose of suffering. And Jesus is the light of the world who ultimately puts an end to suffering. The text begins when, in a very familiar way. Jesus notices a man blind from birth. We've seen this again and again in our study, haven't we? How Jesus notices ordinary people, people that other people would, would just forget and neglect and turn away from. Jesus notices them, the lonely, the lost, the sick, the outcast, the ostracized. It is one of the many attractive characteristics of Jesus. He is God in the flesh, and yet he notices ordinary people. You would think that God in the flesh would uh, only notice the popular, the rich, the powerful, the influential. But that's not the God we worship. We worship a God who recognizes and notices ordinary people. People that the rest of the world turns their back on. Jesus notices the man. And verse 2 tells us that the disciples notice that he notices it's as if the disciples say, Rabbi, teacher, we see you noticing that man born blind, and we have a question for you. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And the question is an interesting one. It's one that's asked many times in our own day. Who sinned for this man to suffer this way? He's been blind from birth, so someone must have sinned, so the disciples think. At the time of Jesus, there were a number of schools of thought about the link between sin and suffering. There were some Jews who believed uh, that a baby could sin before it was born in the womb, and that between the moment of uh, conception and birth, a baby could sin and be responsible for its own suffering. Another school of thought in this same line of thinking believed that in a pre-existent state, a soul could sin. So there were those who blamed the baby. Somewhere along the line, the baby was responsible. That's what the disciples are saying. So this man must have sinned. If he was blind from birth, must be the man. Or there's another train of thought that said that it must be the parents' fault that the baby was blind. They had sinned, and they had a proof text for this thinking, that the parents were responsible for their son's blindness. They had a proof text, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, which says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hurt me, uh, of those who hate me, rather. And we have to think of that text very carefully. For while we know that sinful behavior of our parents, say alcoholism, can have devastating effects on generations to come, we know that. And we know that sinful behavior can be handed down from generation to generation. But can the punishment for such sins be handed down? Think about that. If we believe that no one can become a Christian because of the faith of their parents, and we do believe that, I'm not a Christian because my parents were a Christian, every one of us needs to make their own decision for Christ or against Christ. You cannot be a Christian because your parents were Christian. If the blessings can't be handed down from our Christian parents, if we all have to make our own decision for Christ or against Him, why would we believe that the curses can be handed down? But there are some who believed it to be true. 
And to be sure, as I said in our study of John chapter 5, sometimes, sometimes there is a causal link. There can be clear links between sin and suffering. Sometimes, sometimes. Some ailments are a direct consequence of specific sins. You need to only look at Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, and also 1 John 5, 16. Makes this causal link clear. If you're going to destroy your body with unholy living, with smoking and overeating and no exercise, don't think you will escape a whole slew of bodily illnesses that follow from unholy living. If you're going to gossip, don't think you're going to have a lot of friends who will want to share secrets with you. If you're going to live by the sword, you better be prepared to die by the sword. Sometimes, sometimes suffering is caused by sinful behavior but not all the time. You can't make a principle out of those examples. You can't be dogmatic about suffering. There are some people who are as greedy as sponges, but they never suffer for it. In fact, some of them even seem to prosper. There are some people who smoke like chimneys, but they never get lung cancer. We can't be dogmatic about it. There is no principle here. But this is what the disciples think. So this man was blind, it was believed because of his sin or his parents' sin. There's no other choice because sin causes suffering in the mind of the disciples. And we have that thought in our culture today. There are many who falsely believe that it is because of their sin that suffering comes to them and to their children. People still view God as some sort of insurance policy. If you take out the right policy, not always the easiest thing to do because you have to go to the right kind of church and have the right kind of doctrine. And if you pay your premiums of going as often as you can to worship and putting the right amount in the offering plate, then really bad things won't happen to you because you've invested in God insurance. So Jesus, the disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now look how Jesus responds at verse 3. Now listen carefully. Listen to what Jesus says. This is important. He says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now this can't mean that they were sinless. There's only one who is sinless, and that is Jesus. The blind man and his parents were not sinless. What Jesus is saying is that their sin is not the cause of the blindness. Now just press a hold button for there for a moment because this is huge. Here's a straight answer to a straight question. There's no missing it. There's no misunderstanding it. There's no denying it. The disciples said because this man is suffering, he or his parents must have sinned. There is the causal link. But you have to listen carefully because Jesus says you can't take that as a hard principle. If you suffer, you must be under God's judgment. Jesus says, that's wrong. That's wrong. And he tells the disciples they're wrong in their thinking. And this is the first truth about Jesus being the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world who shines the light of hope on suffering by removing its burden. If there's any area in our life that needs light, it is the darkness of suffering. And Jesus has come to shine the light of hope on suffering by removing its burden of guilt. What do I mean by that? I mean that we often become dogmatic about suffering. And we say that it is the result of sin. And as a result, not only do we suffer, but we carry a huge burden, the burden of guilt with us for our suffering. We think, I'm suffering because I sinned. But listen to what Jesus says. I really want you to hear it. Rabbi, who sinned? The disciples ask. This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus says, neither. Do you hear the hope that is in that? Do you hear the hope that is in those words for so many people who suffer? Some of you need to hear that. Some of you are beating yourself up because you have a child with special needs or you have some physical ailment or you are going through some sort of suffering and you need to hear this because, 
because you think it is the result of some sin in your life. And Jesus breaks that dogmatic thinking and says, you can't make that link. If you're beating up yourself and, and you're thinking that your child has special needs because of some sin in your life, if you think you have some sort of physical ailment because you aren't good enough, stop it. Stop it. You are carrying a burden that you were never intended to carry. It's not biblical and it's not true. It's not logical. I mean, how good do you think you have to be to not have any of those bad things happen to you? What level of goodness do you think you need to achieve so that suffering never comes your way? And how are you ever going to achieve that? I love the story about Leslie Weatherhead. He was a magnificent preacher with a, an amazing um, capacity with the English language. But he was very liberal in his theology. I don't think I could sit under his preaching for too long. But he had a large church uh, called the City Temple in London, England, in the 40s. And during World War II, his church was hit by a bomb and it was totally demolished. And a couple of weeks later, a leading evangelical conservative pastor in London wrote him a letter and said that it was because of his liberal theology that his church was destroyed. And Weatherhead's secretary was furious and wanted to respond right away. How dare you write something? But Weatherhead said, no, wait, just, just wait. Do not write that letter. Just wait. And so they didn't respond. And wouldn't you know it, not long after, the church of that leading evangelical pastor was also bombed to the ground. You see, you can't make a direct tie to sin when it comes to suffering. You need only look at the sinless life of Jesus to know this to be true. Do you know, in the Apostles' Creed, there is only one verb to describe his life, and that verb is the word suffer. Between being conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary and being crucified and dead and buried, there's just one phrase— he suffered under Pontius Pilate. The Son of God, the Word made flesh, was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, yet there was no sin in him. Jesus says there's no direct tie to individual sin and individual suffering. And I pray that some of you who are bearing that heavy burden uh, guilt would have it lifted. It's not always true that there is suffering in your life because of some individual sin. But there's more. Jesus is the light of the world who shines the light of hope on suffering. He lifts the burden of guilt. But he also shines the light of purpose on suffering. Look at the text, verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, all sorts of questions come up at this point. This sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? This man is born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in his life? What? Now, let me see if I can address some of those questions. First, understand that nothing that I will say from now on will make any sense to you if you don't believe in what Jesus says is the ultimate priority in life. Jesus says the ultimate priority in life is that God might be glorified in us, that, that his love, his might, his power, his grace would be seen in us and through us. That's the ultimate priority in life, says Jesus. And that's important to take in. The purpose of life is for us to glorify God. That means that we are to demonstrate his character in our life. That's what it means to glorify God, to demonstrate his character in us. And I would suggest that if you don't agree with that statement, then you can't understand what Jesus is saying here. For instance, if you think, like many people do, that the ultimate purpose of life is success, then as soon as one failure comes your way, you are sure to question the goodness of God and ask if he really is in control. 
Or if you think, as many people do, that the ultimate purpose of life is happiness, then of course you're going to question if God is gracious and, and if his hand is upon you. And, and as soon as you suffer bereavement or any kind of loss, you're going to question the care of God in your life. Or if you think, like many people do, that the ultimate purpose of life is comfort and you persist in believing that life is to be a pleasure cruise on which everything should be smooth and smiling and very kind, then of course, when life isn't like that, you will be terribly, terribly disappointed and feel that there is no truth in the care of God in your life. But, but, if the ultimate purpose of life is not happiness or success or comfort, but something far, far bigger and something brighter and better, something for which you were created for from the very beginning to glorify God by reflecting his character, ah, what if that is the ultimate purpose of life? And I think this is what Jesus is saying. And in saying this, he shines a light of purpose on suffering. Suffering then becomes a means by which God is glorified. His character is demonstrated in us and through us. That means that suffering is not sent something necessarily to rush through. Not something to be gotten rid of and, and, and something to quickly get through. Let that, that's how some in the church usually think. Let's all rush to the faith healer because it, it's not God's will that we suffer. I wonder if we could instead embrace suffering and see it as an opportunity for us to know an ever deeper experience of the power of God, the person of God, and the presence of God in our lives. I know this is not easy teaching. I've shared this on my radio program, our radio program on Hope Today, how I went through a terrible sickness for two and a half years. I couldn't pastor fully. Um, I was in pain. We had to sell our house. We couldn't keep it up. It was a terrible time. And it was hard to think that it was glorifying God and it was hard to think of glorifying God in the midst of it. I know it's a hard truth, but it is a truth nonetheless. Suffering can be a means through which God is glorified. How? Well, what if we began to realize that it is in the midst of stress and difficulty and trouble that we are enabled to see God and the work of God in ways that we never thought possible before. So Paul tells us about a thorn in his flesh in his second letter to the Corinthians. We don't know what the thorn is, but it's something that bothers Paul to such a degree that he pleads with God to remove it. Three times he asks God to remove it, and God says, no, three times. Why? Because that thorn is a means for Paul to have a revelation of who God is. Through it, he discovers an aspect of God's character, his strength and his grace, as he is made to depend on God. So Paul's whole view is changed. What he once saw as a situation sent from Satan in order to torment him is now transformed by the power of God to draw him into an intimate relationship with God. And I know this truth to be real. real. During my illness, I discovered characteristics of God that I knew in my head, but not in my heart. During my illness, I discovered a deeper awareness of God's care, his provision, and his presence like never before. And I wonder if we could change the way we think about suffering, about the trouble that comes into our lives, and see them as times when God has not abandoned us, but are indeed times when God is able to work and display his glory in ways that we've never experienced before. And make no mistake, this isn't God being selfish or ego egotistical. It, it, it is God seeking the very best for you. You were meant to demonstrate the character of God, the joyful, living, radiant, glorious character of God. That's what God wants for you. This isn't selfish. This is what happened to the blind man. God shows his works, his glory, his character through his blindness. And he does. 
Jesus makes some mud, we read in verse 6, by spitting into the dust. He applies the mud to the eyes and he sends the man off to wash and he is healed. In this case, the works of God are displayed in the healing. Now understand that the work of God isn't always displayed in healing. Paul wasn't healed of his malady. This man was. The results in the two cases are different. But what is common is that the purpose of God was accomplished. He was glorified. His character was demonstrated. The healing is for his glory, and the non-healing is for his glory. This line of thinking requires a huge shift for us. We have to start thinking differently about the purpose of life. And we have to see that the greatest purpose of life, the greatest treasure, is to glorify God to demonstrate his character. And if we don't, then none of this will make sense to you and none of this will be helpful for you. Listen carefully. Jesus says that the purpose of the blindness is that the works of God might be displayed in him. He's saying that the works of God, the glory of God, and seeing the work of God is greater than years and years of blindness, both for the blind man and for the parents. Do you see the shift? We place the emphasis on seeing, on health. That's the greatest thing, we think. But Jesus comes and he sheds a light on the true purpose of life. And he says, greater than physical seeing is seeing the work of God. Do you agree? This is important because if you're going to accept this, you have to see that the work of the all-powerful, all-loving, all-gracious God is more wonderful, more awesome, more life-giving than seeing and then even life. Psalm 63 verse 3 says, Your steadfast love is better than life. So John Piper writes, Being loved by God and being with God forever is better than having eyes and better than being alive in this world. If we don't believe that, then saying that God has wise and good purposes in all our losses will not be much comfort. But if we do believe it, then Jesus said, sheds a light on suffering and its purpose so that the works of God might be seen. Are there situations when you feel that God is delaying his response to your prayers for deliverance? Perhaps he's taking his time so that his glory might be fully seen in you and through you. Have you thought of that? God is taking his time in responding to your prayers for deliverance because he wants to show his glory through you. I think of Joni Erickson. A vivacious teenager who broke her neck diving into a lake and was paralyzed from the neck down. And we think of the amazing weight of depression on this young Christian woman with an amazing faith and how she had been assured by her friends that God would heal her, only to grow through her teens and then into her 20s and realize that, that prayers weren't being answered like that and growing into maturity where she began to say that she could perhaps understand why God hadn't healed her. And we see a vibrant woman confined to a wheelchair, unable to move her upper torso, with an enormous faith, a wonderful ministry to handicapped children, a wonderful artist, an author, a singer, but above all, a person through whom the glory of God shines through to this day. Well, one last word. Jesus is the light of the world who shines a light of hope on suffering. He's the light of the world who sheds a light on the purpose of suffering. And third, he's the light of the world who destroys the darkness of suffering. Verse 4, he says, As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. What is the night that is coming that Jesus refers to? What, what, what's he talking about? Well, I believe he's referring to his crucifixion. The night of suffering is coming for Jesus, as we will see as we continue in our study. On that dark night, Jesus will suffer not for his sins, 
but for our sins. We will be the cause of his suffering. But that's not all. There is a glorious purpose to his suffering. What's the purpose of Christ's suffering on the cross? It is to show the work of God. He will bear the wrath. He will remove the curse. He will take away our sin so that we, in the end, will have victory over the ultimate suffering of death. I know there's suffering now. I know there is suffering now. But I am confident in telling you that it won't always be like this. There will be a day when, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ and in his sacrifice for you, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will be passed away, as we read in 2 Corinthians. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. My friends, there is a great darkness in suffering, but a light has dawned. A light has dawned, and his name is Jesus Christ. And in him, we have hope. In him, we have purpose. In him, we have victory over suffering, even death. May God be praised. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we need you. Oh, how we need you. Some of us, God, are going through great suffering, and we need you to come and minister to us in the midst of it. Grant that we would know the victory that you promise us even in our pain. May our eyes be firmly fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we may demonstrate God and that God be glorified in the midst of our suffering. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.